I spent my formative years in a privileged setting in the beautiful country of Oman. Five air conditioners in the four-room apartment we lived in, running water in the taps that literally came from boiling the ocean, never a power cut, and petrol prices that didn't see a rise in the six years that I was there. I spent six years there and returned to Chennai in 1998 as a 15-year-old. Power cuts were a norm and scheduled and advertised in the newspapers. Amma had to schedule her mixer and wet grinder operations on the back of that. Power holidays for industry were a common place in the budding Detroit of Asia. Water had to be pumped, drinking water had to be hand pumped and raised three stories. Petrol prices, we didn't really have a car but, or a vehicle, but the auto drivers would tell us that they were indeed high. So the bus became the go-to option. Cut to 2020, much has changed and much has not changed. Chennai, the capital of one of the most prosperous states of the country, still has power cuts. Um, it has a desalination plant, ironically, but many, uh, many households actually have a bore well that sucks the earth dry. Petrol prices are at, at historic prices, but private vehicles are an order of magnitude higher in number and buses are struggling to cope with this rapid increase in traffic. This juxtaposition of the energy state of two different societies is really what got me interested in the energy system as an adolescent. And as, an, as a professional, this is sort of becoming all-consuming to understand what exactly does the future hold in store for us. Why are we discussing energy, you would ask? As historian Dipesh Chakrabarti eloquently puts it, any concrete exercising of human freedom that goes beyond the abstract notion of freedom itself requires the consumption of energy. Billions of people need to be uh, improved, uh, the standard of living of billions of people need to be improved. And this means that we're looking at a world with more energy, not less. Historically, the world has relied on cheap and abundant fossil fuels to raise the living standards of people. But just when we, India and the developing world, are hitting our growth phase, we are realizing that the world is waking up to warming atmosphere, melting ice, acidifying and warming oceans, and a whole host of uh, problems that uh, rapidly accelerating climate change in the last two centuries has thrown up. And will continue to in this defining 21st century of uh, the Anthropocene epoch. India and the developing world are caught in the crossfires. We've only made a paltry contribution to the warming thus far because our absolute energy put footprint has been so small. But if we continue our reliance uh, on fossil fuels in a climate changed world, it is unlikely that we'll have enough resources to maintain a semblance of what we've taken for granted. For instance, the monsoons that we rely on, the rainfall from the monsoons, the longevity of our perennial rivers, or even the summer mango season that makes the Indian summer so tolerable. Uh, the image that you see here is of uh, Delhi and India warming since the 1900s. Uh, this clearly shows uh, what scientists have been telling us for the last six decades now. It is warming up really fast. Combine this with the erratic rainfall patterns, the interspersed, the frequency of the interspersed floods and droughts, and it should be clear to our policymakers that climate change is impacting us now and today. Why then are we not taking it seriously? I argue with my colleagues at work that it's because humans are very good at adapting, or at least we think we are. Uh, getting hotter? No problem. More cooling devices will be there for us. Uh, lakes and rivers running dry? Uh, no problem. We can uh, easily drill more holes and suck the earth dry or pump water from faraway sources. What we're doing at best is coping. That's what much of the poorer world really does. At the other end of the development spectrum, you have cities like Tokyo, which have built this giant cavern uh, at a cost of $2 billion, completed after 13 years of uh, civil works in 2006 which helps accommodate floods that have increasingly become common uh, in, the, in a climate change world. This can accommodate 80% of the reservoirs that supply to the city of Chennai. The pumps that are connected to this can empty a standard size swimming pool in three seconds. This is engineering at a scale that is climate proofing your future truly. India is very far away from doing this. Coping will only get us so far. We don't have enough resources for our 1.4 billion people. As the Japan example illustrated, the richer and developed you are, your ability to adapt increases. If energy is the basic building block that improves quality of life and improves your ability to adapt, what can we say about how our energy system should serve us? I'm not going to tell you about all the technology out there to tame the sun and harness the wind and make the future a better place. That's the future we want to get to. But let me acquaint you with a few problems that our current system actually faces, if we don't address, can actually cripple the, the very future that we're looking for. The COVID-19 situation illustrates all that ails our energy system. The air has not been as clean as in the initial months of the lockdown and tells us how much of the air pollution actually comes from energy-consuming activity. 
This realization was made stark by this image that many of you might recollect seeing. The Dolodar Mountains are seen from 200 kilometers away from the city of Jalandhar when not covered in a permanent haze. Fossil fuels contribute to more than two-thirds of the particulate matter that pollutes the air. Coal is a leading contributor of this. It is ubiquitous in India primarily because it is cheaply domestically available and is relatively cheap. However, we burn poor quality coal, we burn it inefficiently and we don't control for emissions that come out of industries and power plants. As a result, the burden the society faces overrides any potential benefit that we actually get from it. Our cities manage waste, a source of energy, suboptimally. Though hamstrung by poor finances, they spend as much as 1000 rupees on a family of four annually in just collecting and hauling waste to the landfill where it gets burnt and makes the air toxic. Cities also have the added pollution burden from burgeoning private transport because public transport has not been invested in. What little clean havens existed two decades ago don't anymore. Air pollution is the second leading cause of uh, premature mor mor in in mortality in India and results in 1.2 million premature deaths annually. It results in uh, cognitive uh, disabilities in children, uh, imp compromises lung function and a range of cardiovascular morbidities in, uh, in older people as well. It endangers the very future that we're looking to nurture. Renewable energy will come and save the day in 10 to 15 years. But how do we breathe the air and keep a semblance of growing the economy until then? This just has to change. One is often reminded of the statistic in the climate change debate. While we as a country have low per capita consumption, the disparity in how we consume energy is also stark. For instance, the average household in Delhi consumes as much electricity as a household in Germany. Let that sink in. 35% of India's households cook using solid fuels, uh, firewood, dung cake, crop residue, coal, which impacts, adversely impacts the health of women and children in the household as they are the ones who are most exposed to it. We feel that the rotis that are cooked on these, on these chulas actually taste better. It's a very quaint statement to make, but if you were to actually go to the household of those who actually use this to cook and look at the jet black uh, soot stained walls of the kitchen, you actually know this is the impact that it's going to have on their lungs in the long term. One could argue that this is an artifact of the rich-poor divide. The rich consume more and they consume cleaner fuels. But what if I were to tell you that Delhi, for instance, has the most, re most generous subsidies for electricity consumption among all the st uh, cities in the states in the country. The average resident of Delhi pays nothing for consuming up to 200 units of electricity a month. The same level of consumption in a rural part of Jharkhand or Rajasthan, the consumer would have to in uh, incur an uh, expense of about 1000 rupees a month. That's significant. LPG subsidies. Who do you think deserves LPG subsidies more? The white collar urban resident or the poor rural household that could use a leg up when the prices of LPG are on the rise. LPG is expensive and the subsidies on this are uniform. More than the bottom 30% of the households actually account only for 15% of the LPG subsidy outlay today. It's basically expensive for them. And the top 10% account for 22% of the subsidy outlay, which means that the rich are consuming a disproportionate amount of LPG itself. We continue to build more flyovers and expressways despite 63% of the urban population reporting that walking is the most frequently used mobility choice for them. How many cities invest in cycling and walking infrastructure, or for that matter, even in improving public transport? Cyclists and uh, pedestrians who constitute uh, the lower economic strata in most cities account for nearly 50% of the road fatalities in Delhi. This is because we don't give enough, cho enough thought to their commuting and safety, uh, safety needs. We make pedestrians uh, cross roads by, uh, through overpasses to elevated overpasses, do not have uh, dedicated uh, signals for them to cross the road, and we in fact given more uh, room for parking than we allow for uh, uh, cyclists to use the roads in our cities. All of this suggests that we've not really catered to their needs at all. So we found that the energy system that we have impacts us adversely on a local level environmentally and is inequitable. To add to this, India has one of the most expensive energy systems in the world on a per capita energy uh, cost basis. This is true when you consider fossil fuels or electricity. I would say this is primarily because energy system is largely in the hands of the central government, the state government and public sector undertakings. And all of them thrive on and are even addicted to the revenues that accrue from the extraction and supply of energy itself. Eight of the ten Maharatnas of Government of India are energy companies. If you ever happen to visit the offices of one of these, notice the swanky reception, the cutlery used in the meetings, or dry fruit served to guests. All of these are way above par for Government of India standards itself. We are paying for all of this. Government revenues accrue from taxes, 
uh, assesses duties and uh, other charges on uh, petroleum itself. In the last three financial years, nearly 20% of central government revenues came from petroleum sector and 30% of state governments came from the petroleum sector. Clearly, this is an important source of revenue for governments itself. Our policies perpetuate our dependence on fossil fuels. Cities and states do not make public transport easily available and as a result people choose to buy bikes and uh, cars. 50% of the on-road price of uh, petrol is actually a tax. Now one could argue that this is ultimately public spending. But what it actually does is make the everyday experience of living that much more expensive and this is not sustainable and stifles the economy itself. Energy has a domino effect on the economy. For instance, the Indian Railways charges too little for passengers at ferries. As a result, it's a loss-making service and it loses traffic and revenue to road and even aviation. To compensate for this, they charge, they charge astronomical rates for freight. Coal freight contributes nearly 45% of the re revenues of Indian Railways and increases the delivered cost of coal for power plants. Inefficient coal-fired coal power plants burn more coal and as a result produce electricity which is very expensive. Electricity companies that actually sell this then find it difficult to recoup, the revenue, to recoup this money from their end consumers. On top of this, we give electricity free for our farmers. This is a moral hazard because this results in excessive consumption and a lot of subsidy outlay itself. Now, as a result of all of this, industries and uh, commercial entities, you know, your institutions, hospitals, everyone else is charged an astronomical price to make good for the losses they incur in other sectors. Ultimately, they just don't make enough money. Each year, the Indian electricity utilities together lose about 50,000 crore. That's a lot of money to be losing. Your local electricity company is perennially bankrupt. When they actually cut electricity supply, they think they're saving money, but in reality what they're doing is precluding economic activity by not making energy available to the people who want to use it. The status quo is not easy to change. The energy sector contributes a lot of resources to government and energy is a freebie that draws votes when elections come calling. Unfortunately, it is also used to suppress the needs of the disenfranchised. The outcome is that we're coughing and wheezing throughout the year and production and consumption within the economy is that much more expensive. To meet the important goals of emissions and equity, we need a wholesale upheaval of the energy system. How does renewable energy solve any of this? It actually doesn't. It increases the challenges that we have in transitioning transition to a better system. There are three areas where I say interventions are needed. The first is going to sound a little trite, but technology adoption is key. Technology is a mere enabler in many cases. For instance, uh, public information systems for buses. Imagine, if you had the information regarding when the buses, next bus is going to come or if there is a seat available in it. A lot more people would adopt buses and public transport if they had this kind of information and there was certainty to their trip times. The second is technology in, for instance, the electricity sector, smart meters and automated meter reading that could actually help utilities improve compliance and revenue recovery. It will also help give them a sense of that how diverse their consumer base is and price electricity according to the value that a consumer places on it. It also helps reduce electricity theft, which is significant across the country today. Technology is also needed to improve uh, the uh, environmental outcomes associated with the end use of energy and improving health outcomes for people. BS6 technologies, uh, emissions monitoring from uh, industries, uh, technology to scrub from smokestacks, harmful gases that come out of it, uh, sewage treatment plants and a whole host of waste to wealth technologies that will ensure that our cities and our rivers are not uh, overwhelmed. And finally you have this blue skies technologies that will help us wean away from our dependence on fossil fuels itself. I'm talking about solar panels, electric vehicles, batteries, hydrogen industry. But it's not just about procuring new technology from overseas for a price. That will merely replace our dependence on oil today with a new tech. What we need is to spin a domestic, a domestic industry that will ensure that we are able to create value locally for it. For this, we have to invest in R&D, in local human resources, and ensure that India uses its soft power to make the world its supplier base for materials and components, just the way that China did in the latter half of the last century. India can very well do this. This is an opportunity for industrialists to actually step up and ensure that we are creating jobs and wealth locally within the economy itself. The second is a change at a philosophical and a governance level, if you will. Given the importance that energy holds for the future of our development and of humanity itself, it cannot remain a commodity that is underpriced, overtaxed and consumed uh, in an abusive manner. We must internalize the cost that, uh, that energy consumption puts on the environment itself. By bypassing environmental standards and all end uses, we've not necessarily got energy that is cheaper. If you were to actually internalize the cost of pollution that, uh, uh, that energy use actually puts out, it creates a level playing field for new technologies and new entrants that will eventually replace the fuels that we use today. 
Most importantly, uh, energy, energy resources form an important source of revenue for government uh, finances and for resource uh, for development in general. Uh, replacing this is not an easy task, but what we can do is get our first principles right. We can set right the historical wrongs of having ignored the energy needs of the poor. Uh, for a country that actually managed to give uh, LPG connections to 8 crore poor consumers in a matter of 3 years and to connect the bank accounts with the consumer IDs of 20 lakh LPG consumers, surely we can figure out who needs support for consuming energy and who can pay a fair price. The administrative capacity exists, but can the people will it? A lot of economists after the pandemic noted that putting, en putting money in the hands of the poor people will actually stimulate consumption in the economy and generally improve the overall economic outcomes. If you were to actually make energy access more equitable and accessible, it will ensure that opportunities for the poor increase, increases job opportunities and increases the overall economic pie. Possibly this will mean that governments can make do with lesser taxes on energy as they will have other sources of energy and uh, other sources of revenue to rely on for uh, their uh, revenues itself. Finally, ingredient X that will be needed is a behavioral nudge that will move each citizen in the right direction, rethinking our individual and collective energy choices. The water we drink, the foods we consume, how we clothe ourselves, uh, what mobility choices we have, whether we segregate our waste or not, and what temperature we set our air conditioners on. Each of this has a bearing on the energy use and ultimately on our health and well-being. Living within a tight energy budget must be an aspirational goal for all citizens. The reasons for this can be multifarious. It can rise from intergenerational equity thoughts, a health conscious energy choice, uh, can result from a pure economic or even a risk mitigation strategy. But what is important is that we use some of these levers to appeal to the appropriate consumer segments to ensure that this transition can actually be made. The pandemic has already forced us to rethink many things we took for granted. It has also shown that nature's ability to rejuvenate is not lost. We are at an inflection point of historic proportions now. Do we have the energy to bend the right way? Thank you.